Turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 22. As we've been walking through the book of Joshua so far, it has centered around the concept and the idea really of God's fidelity or his faithfulness to his people. And as we saw last week, kind of culminating all of that and summarizing it in the most simple way possible, a single verse in chapter 21, 45, the writer wrote, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. And so that is your summary of the first 21 chapters of Joshua that God in his faithfulness has carried out everything that he has promised and he has not failed a single time to do any of it. But these last three weeks, this week and the next two weeks, we will be closing out the very final section of this book, which revolves around Israel's faithfulness to God. The response that all those that are called by God should have to him is complete fidelity because it is not only expected but required by those who belong to the Heavenly Father. So, if you wouldn't mind standing, we're going to read the first portion, the first six verses of Joshua 22 from the Word of God. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Pray with me this morning. God, as we dial in and focus on this passage of Scripture this morning, I pray that we would see the importance of a fidelity and a faithfulness to you. That for those of us who have been saved and redeemed in Christ, It is not just an expectation, but a requirement that we would be holy as you are holy. That the only proper response of those who have been truly redeemed and restored by you is a wholehearted obedience and faithfulness to you as well. And Lord, even though there are times where we fail, we are grateful that your mercy is never ending and your forgiveness is always present for those who seek it. So God, we praise you for this and we thank you and we pray all these things in your name, amen. You may be seated. In this first chapter, or in this chapter 22, not first chapter, but in chapter 22, we see the first section, the first nine verses, a commendation that is given. And this draws us back, actually, to the very beginning of Joshua because we see a, con, uh, a commendation that is given to the two and a half tribes. If you remember back in chapter one, when Joshua spoke to the tribes of Reuben and, and Gad and Manasseh, they were that they were to, again, as they were going in to conquer Jericho, the promise that was made through Moses or by, by them to Moses was brought up again, was reminded of them what they were to do. And it was 
after they had conquered their land and after they had conquered Jericho and were ready to enter into the promised land, that they would continue on over rather than staying behind so that the rest of their brothers might be able to occupy their land. Oftentimes, the way that it would work, and and this happens, you know this, once you get what you wanted or what you were promised, there's no need to go on for anyone else. And so you happily will take what you deserve or receive and, and you'll go home with it and, and everyone else just is, has to fend for themselves. But that's not the promise that was made from these two and a half tribes. The promise that they gave was that they would continue with Israel so they would not grow weary or faint-hearted and they too would find their inheritance in the promised land, even though they'd already achieved theirs. And so they were to follow Israel over the Jordan with their warriors to help Israel take the rest of the promised land. And after many, many years, again, the the chapters in Joshua span many years, so much so that Joshua, the young man that took charge of Israel uh, at the time of Jericho and really in his, his youth there, has now grown very, very old, which means that all of these warriors and these fighters that came all over with them were also very old. And after these many years of fighting and conquest, these men who have been away from their families all this time are finally finding their duty come to a close. And Joshua reiterates their faithfulness to the rest of Israel, and giving them thanks, he permits them to leave to return home to their people in their land. In verse 3, Joshua says, you have not forsaken your brothers these many days, down to this day, but you have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. It was not only their faithfulness to their brothers in Israel, as Joshua reiterates, but it was by relation faithfulness to their God by upholding the promise that they made all those years ago. Matthew Henry said, though it was by the favor of God and His power that Israel got possession of this land, and He must have all the glory Yet Joshua thought there was a thankful acknowledgement due to their brethren who assisted them and whose sword and bow were employed for them. God must be chiefly eyed in our praises, yet instruments must not be altogether overlooked. So this fidelity, this faithfulness of these two and a half tribes of, of Israel And following through what they were doing was not just faithfulness to their brothers and sisters in Israel, but also faithful to the God who called them to it. But Joshua doesn't leave them just with a attaboy, smack them on the back and send them back over the Jordan, but he also gives them a very, very crucial warning to obey God's commands. He leaves them with a strict exhortation to this fidelity and this faithfulness. In verse 5, he says, only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law of Moses that the servant of the Lord commanded you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. The language that he uses here is to observe, to love, to walk, And all of these expressions are used to describe a proper human response to the grace of God. There is no other proper response to the grace of God other than these things. To observe what He requires. Micah 6.8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Not only that, but to love what He loves. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. You do not get to be a faithful follower of Christ if you love the things that He hates and you hate the things that He loves. And finally, to walk in a manner that is worthy of the grace that has called you. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That the Christian life is not saying a prayer 
and getting your free ticket into heaven. It is a complete change of your life. It is a refusal and a rejection of the old self and a putting on of the new in a way that is walking in the ways of Christ and is seeking after all of the things of God because He is holy and because it's expected. And then Joshua blesses in verses 6 through 9 the Transjordan tribes to return home with their share of the spoils of war and instructions then to give it generously to their brothers back in their land. And so you see in this first section, the first nine verses, all is well in the promised land. Or so you might think. But then we move on to verse 10 and we see that there is a confrontation that is made. It says, And when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. The writer is very, very intentional in making that distinction of this altar. No sooner than they returned, the first act to be carried out was to build an altar, and not just any altar, but a massive altar that, that was larger than or was imposing in its size with the altar that was built in the mainland of Israel at Shiloh, where the offerings and the sacrifices were made. It was an altar of imposing size, which means it was either larger than or it was very, very close to the size of the altar that was built in Shiloh. And so when Israel hears of this, They all quickly and very rapidly assemble together at Shiloh, the place where they would meet to wage war against the Transjordan tribes. And you think, hold on, why? What's going on here? What's the the big point? What's the, the, the big deal about all of this? Well, you see, Shiloh was the central place of worship in the Promised Land prior to the building of the temple in Jerusalem. And so when Israel had come in and they started conquering the land, Shiloh was where they set up more or less the main base of operations. That would be the place where the tabernacle would sit and and the people would commune with God and offer their sacrifices and offerings there. This would have been the place where the altar of the Lord was set up. And it would have been the only altar in all of Israel where sacrifices were permitted to be made. And you can see this in uh, Deuteronomy 12. Uh, 5 through 6, but I'm going to read back a little bit more in in verse 1, starting there, to get some context. It says, These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord your God, uh, the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you dispossess serve their gods. On the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree, you shall tear down their altars and dash to pieces uh, their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. The writer was very clear of how God was to be worshipped. Instead, this is what we see, Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6. But... You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And then continuing down, verses 13 and 14, the writer continues. He says, Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose. In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I am commanding you. Seems like a pretty straightforward rule and command, right? There's no ambiguity to be found here. There's no questioning, there's no way 
than any kind of serpent theology of, did God really say? No, he was very clear in this. And so the people of Israel gathered together, a few people, out of the, the large army that was amassing for war to go and confront and talk some sense into these tribes. You see, the altar was viewed as an act of rebellion. And so this new altar was a problem in Israel. It was huge. It was a huge rival altar outside the central location that was commanded to have an altar to the Lord, Leviticus 17, 8 and 9. Dale Ralph Davis commented on this important piece of Israel's structure, and he said that the restriction of sacrifices to one sanctuary was preventative theology intended to preserve the purity of worship. To oversimplify it meant one altar, one faith, one people. It was symbolic in that way. So this new altar that was built in Israel was a problem. In fact, it demanded disciplinary action due to the blasphemous apostasy that had happened. You could find that in Deuteronomy 13, 12 through 18. This news of another altar in the land likely meant that there was a case of man-centered worship that was going on, and it would be a killing blow to Israel's expected and required faithfulness to the God who delivered them into that land. And so, a small group of people are selected and sent. It says in verse 13, Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. And so a delegation is sent. Now Phineas was actually, again, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And so Phineas was from the line of Aaron, the priesthood. And back in Numbers 25, there was a situation that happened while Israel was living in Shittim. You see, in Numbers 25, Israel began to yoke themselves together and intermarry with the daughters of Moab. And this caused them to be swayed and to start sacrificing also to the gods of the Moabites, namely the god Baal. This made God very angry because He's a jealous God, and there is no other God in creation that deserves the worship more than our God. And so God, in His anger, allowed a plague to fall among the people. And in Numbers 25, you see that Phineas is actually recorded in killing a man of Israel who brought his pagan Midianite woman to the tent of meeting, a grave and a blasphemous error. And it was Phineas's quick response to the sin of Israel that curbed the plague from the people, and God relented from that and took the plague off of the people of Israel. And so it only made sense, it would only make sense that he would be among this delegation that's going in to talk to these two and a half tribes. One may think that this quick action to rally the people together from war would be considered rash and uncalled for amidst maybe a seemingly simple misunderstanding that could be talked out. But it's actually Israel's quick action here that at the sight of unfaithfulness that actually shows signs of health among the people because they understood the holiness of their God. They understood the importance of preserving themselves in a way that is in aligned with His statutes and His commands. And so at the sight of any error, they are ready to go forward and to correct it. but they do not strike first without speaking first to the eastern tribes, which is, again, another sign of health. 
It is one thing to be prepared to make a defense. It is another one to fly off the handle without thinking and to just let words go loose. You can read Proverbs and it'll tell you much of people who do that and he calls them fools. And so Israel was not rash and quick in this going in and and just wiping everything out, but they were quick to assemble and be ready for it. They were prepared to defend their God. So Israel instead offers in verse 19, says this, but now if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. And so the concern is by building this altar in this land, apart from the true altar that's located at Shiloh, you are in an act of rebellion against God. And because of that rebellion, if, if the, the land has been corrupted in this time that, that you were gone before you came back to it and, and the people have lost their way and they've abandoned God, then, then gather who's left, those that will be the faithful few, and come over into the land and dwell in safety with us and abandon this land, almost as if to say that that land across the Jordan wasn't God's as well. But it was. And so the Israel instead offers the eastern tribes the option to join them in the mainland where the true tabernacle resides so they could put off their rebellion against God and put off the false tabernacle that they had erected there. And so Joshua and his delegation urge the call to repentance. Repentance is a turning away from sin. And so they urge them to call this call to repentance to turn away from their sin over the choice of apostasy, which is turning away from God. And an example is given in verse 20. The delegation says, Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in this matter of devoted things? And wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel. And he did not perish alone for his iniquity. So you recall the story that we went through of Achan, where because of his greed towards these devoted things that were meant to be devoted to destruction, Israel lost a critical battle in the city of Ai. That needless death happened because of Achan's failure to devote himself to the commands of God. Achan's sin was a matter of breaking faith with the devoted things of God. His light adherence and selfish greed for what God deemed important is what brought destruction upon himself and even those around him. Sin that is permitted to continue will bring judgment on all. Sin is not just an individual matter that affects just the person, but it affects those that are in contact with that person. And that tolerating unfaithfulness, especially in worship, will infect the people even more, as seen in the case of Achan. John Calvin wrote, here then we have an illustrious display of piety, teaching us that if we see the pure worship of God corrupted, we must be strenuous to the utmost of our ability in vindicating it. That the worship of our God is no light and simple matter. The Lord's day is not just another thing on your calendar that we do. It is not just the result of, I want to be named as a Christian and so I go to church. It's a very critical component of the worship of our God. And in our current day, part of the problem of this climate that we have in the church is that the church faces this foreign view that it's some kind of democracy. And out of this, a plurality of doctrines, even those that are considered essential, are shared, are tolerated, and even welcomed 
Because who are we to judge the interpretation of others and to bring them under discipline? This was the case that Israel was finding themselves in with the eastern tribes. The current day would look at those eastern tribes, would see this blasphemous altar that was built, and they would have said, we don't want to we don't want to like upset them. We don't want them to, to feel like we, you know, that they're, they're doing something wrong here. So we don't want to, to cause any kind of discipline. We don't want to correct their, their problematic stance here of building this altar that was not commanded by God and sacrificing to those things. But we have to understand that the church is not a democracy, it's a monarchy. And all of its members are not only under the authority of me, but are under the authority of King Jesus. We don't get to take a vote on what we say is right. God has already determined that. And He has given it clearly in His Word, and we are to uphold that with the utmost importance. The church today would do good to recover such a strong piety an enamored adherence to the true worship of God. But then we get into verse 21 through 29. We see that there's concern among Israel and really what that concern ends up being. As this delegation party comes in and they confront these eastern tribes, we see their response. It says, Then the people of Reuben... The people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, the mighty one God, the Lord, the mighty one God, the Lord, he knows and let Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today. For building an altar to turn away from following the Lord Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. No, but we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? And so we see something here that gets cleared up very quickly. The response of the eastern tribes is to not get defensive and say, who are you to tell me? But to say, if this is true, if we are truly breaching faith and rebelling to God, may He Himself enact His vengeance on us. Because that would have been a very serious issue. But instead, they say that the altar was not made for us to offer sacrifices to, but it was meant to be a memorial so that the people in the East across the Jordan, and the western people of Israel would see a commonality in the monument that was set up. The altar was meant to be a representation of the altar that was built at Shiloh, not to make offerings to it, but so that there was a visible sign that people could say to see, they have a similar altar like ours. They're not sacrificing on it, but they have it there as a visual witness that they are a part of us. And this is what the eastern tribes had shared. Now, I imagine there was some relief on the part of Israel that was afraid that they had just gone off into blasphemy to hear this. How relieving it must have been for Israel that what they feared to be infidelity was actually a godly anxiety on the part of the eastern tribes. In verse 25, they share the reason for their fear. It says this, For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord, so your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Their fear was that because they were on the opposite side of the Jordan River in a different area, that there was a boundary that separated them, that over time people would forget either the children in Israel or the children in the, the, the far lands on the other side of the Jordan would forget that they were a part of the same stock. 
And they said, so we built this altar not to sacrifice, not to blaspheme God, not to show ourselves apostate, but to show ourselves unified with you because we don't want to be forgotten. They didn't want to be pushed out of the assembly of Yahweh. They did not want their sons and their daughters to be treated with disdain by the tribes west of the Jordan due to their separation and this boundary that laid between them. I think many of us can speak to this godly anxiety that we have. Even within our own families, no one is more concerned about the eternal state of our descendants than parents and grandparents are. The altars that we build are out of the bricks of prayer, tears, and of sweat as we intercede on behalf of those that we love the most. No one wants to see their family lost. And so we have the same godly anxiety to see those that are near to us come close to Christ and to know His forgiveness and His love. And so this altar was built and the altar was meant to be a witness between the two lands that they were actually one, a copy that connects them with the rest of Israel. And so in verse 30 through 34, the last section here, we see that the conflict is resolved. When Phinehas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation and the heads of the families of Israel who were with him heard the words of the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. The leadership was relieved to hear this response because the last thing they wanted to do was to come in and wage war on their own people because of their lost faith and their lack of fidelity. Instead, Phineas responds in verse 31 with this, today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. It meant that the people in their time of absence from their full number had not abandoned Yahweh. It meant that God would not be angry with all of Israel, punishing them for the rebellion of the other tribes. And so the attack is called off. The people were satisfied by the reports of the chiefs and the the delegation party that comes back And they were happy to hear the news. They called off the war and they were blessing God because they saw the Lord's protection of his people in the midst of this situation in their new land that they'd been given. And then in verse 34, as it closes it out, it says here that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad called the altar witness. For they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. The altar was named witness because it was meant to be simply that, a witness between them and the rest of Israel. This altar would reaffirm that Yahweh was God, just like the New Testament affirms that Jesus is Lord. This confession of truth is what brings true unity among God's people, and apart from truth, there can be no unity. I was listening recently to a a podcast teaching and the concept was over, the the subject matter of the the podcast, I believe it was R.C. Sproul that was talking about it, was the the matter of truth, the subject of, of truth. And it doesn't matter, that's the thing with truth, is it brings confrontation. It doesn't matter how gently you you speak the truth. It doesn't matter how winsomely you present it to others. There will always be conflict that comes with truth because we are sharing that truth with a world that is constantly suppressing it and rejecting it. There can be no unity outside of truth. We would do well to understand this and know that our adherence and what we hold to is truth. Not simply 
fearing that the relationship may be damaged. Because when you are talking to someone who is already in a damaged relationship with God and who has no care for him anyway, there's going to be some friction when truth is brought up. And until God himself wakes them up to their state of depravity, and they see because of the, the, the presentation of the gospel that they are fallen and sinful and, in, and without hope, they will not see the need for truth. And so our primary directive is to share that truth with people that they might know who Christ is and what he has done. We're to be a witness to each other in unity and to the world in truth. If only all conflicts could end like Joshua 22. With a blessing to God, a wiping away of the sweat from our brow and saying, whew, glad it didn't go south. And there's much to be gleaned from the events of this story. There's a lot of small applications that can kind of be pulled out and, and used and everything, but I think to focus on the lesser practicalities like the danger of spreading rumors or the great tragedy of misunderstandings or the importance of talking out our problems, I think to focus on those aspects within this text is to miss the greater matter of the need to remain faithful to God. Just as God has always been faithful to us, we are to respond in faithfulness to Him. And so here's my challenge for you this week. Nurture a concern for holiness. Nurture a concern for holiness in how you carry yourself among God's people, in how you carry yourself among the people of this world, in how you take responsibility for the spiritual growth of your household and those dependent on or influenced by you. Nurture a concern for holiness in how you consider and interact with your God in your own personal relationship with Him. Are you quick to repent of the sin that you detest in your life? Are you swift to the foot of the cross where heaps of forgiveness lie? Are you urgent in your prayer because of your great need for God's complete and sustaining power in every aspect of your life? Are you nurturing a deeply rooted concern for holiness in your life? Pray with me. Father, as we... As we reflect on Joshua 22 and the critical importance that is found therein of being a holy people that is faithful to you and you alone, I pray that you would draw us closer to yourself, that you would convict us where it is that we are failing to follow through and the areas that you have expected us. God, I pray that our concern and our godly anxiety for the holiness of our, of our lives and, and of this church would be of utmost importance. That our primary desire would be to, to live wholly dedicated to you in all aspects. that our concern would not be for the things of this world, for making enough money, for having a nice enough house, for checking off all of the boxes of the American dream, but that our desire for ourselves and for our children and the generations to come would be that they know Christ and his resurrection. God, promote in us a concern for holiness. We ask that you would do this, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.